I'm Darius McDermott from Fund Calibre, and today I'm joined by Nick Edwardson, Senior Product Specialist for Multi-Asset at Aegon, to talk about the Aegon Diversified Monthly Income Fund. Nick, good morning. Darius, good morning. Nice to see you here. So Nick, this is the first time we've we spent any time discussing the fund, so maybe if you'd tell us a little bit about the fund, the aim, and how you go about finding opportunities and what type of investor you think this product might be suitable for? Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Darius. Um, it, it's an unconstrained um, multi-asset income solution, uh, in effect. When I say unconstrained, you know, we don't have a, a benchmark or a, a fixed strategic allocation that we work towards. We're looking for the, the best opportunities, and that evolves clearly as the macro picture changes, uh, to deliver on our three objectives, which are a 5% yield, uh, some capital growth over the medium term, and a risk profile, lower risk than equities. Actually, we think that the, the benefits of diversification will give us a, a risk profile that's between half and two thirds of global equity markets. Um, how do we do that? Well, the multi-asset team is 14 strong, and their primary role in this is the asset allocation decisions. How much do we want in bonds? How much in equities? But it's very to leverage the asset class specialists across the much broader Aegon Asset Management Group. So our fixed income team, our equity team, our real assets, as well as the RI, mustn't forget them as well on the ESG perspective, all help um, with a very collaborative approach to, to bringing together security selection, which populates the portfolio, because this is a bespoke portfolio. It's not a fund of funds. Um, it's derivative light. Um, it is broadly long only. Uh, and it, who's it appropriate for? Um, frankly, anyone these days who's looking for either an income for income's sake or um, as part of a total return solution. Uh, you know, income has its own merits, and I think particularly so in the current climate. So you talked about one of the objectives then being that yield above 5%. And I see the yield is actually sort of <clears throat> above 6 which is very attractive. Is that um, sustainable or is that just a function of the, 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 the income that you can get from equity and bonds today? It is attractive, uh, first off, absolutely. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. It's a function of, of a couple of things. Firstly, the, the growth that we have managed in the actual income that we've distributed per unit over the course of the last 18 months, um, that's been strong. I think that growth will probably taper a little bit, um, but we'll look to continue to deliver the same level of income. Um, and the second element is clearly the decline in the NAV over the course of the, of the year to date. Um, everyone's familiar with uh, markets and, and how they've moved in the last nine months. Uh, so the capital value decline affects that yield calculation. Um, I think the yield figure will probably come back from six as that capital value uh, rises. And I think it will recover. Markets will recover from the current level. Um, it will. That's why the yield will fall, not because we're not delivering the income that we're currently delivering. But that takes me nicely into one of your major asset classes, which is bonds. Um, yeah. Been a very tough year for bonds, uh, particularly in the rising rate environment, which we've seen in 2022. What are your thoughts on the asset class today and how much more attractive are the income opportunities from bonds today than maybe they were a year or so ago? Uh, key point, frankly, um, at the moment, you know, the return, the total return on sterling corporate bonds year to date has been worse than that of the FTSE All Share. Um, but as yields have risen, uh, as the risk-free rate has risen and the, and the spreads on corporate credit have widened, we get to the point where some of this stuff actually looks really quite attractive. And so one of the biggest shifts in our portfolio year to date has been the increase in the bond component from about 32, 33% um, end of January to 45, 46% today. And a chunk of that has been in sovereigns, uh, in our US Treasury allocation, which is up to about 9% and a bit more. Uh, we very much kept duration low. Um, and I think that's that's clearly been the right course. Uh, but that picture is perhaps changing a little bit too. Uh, so amongst the corporate credit allocation, maybe the, the 
the biggest shift has been in the investment grade element in, in recent months. But I think uh, when you can get seven, eight, nine percent and more on high yield, and when you can get five, six, seven on IG, it looks pretty attractive. And therefore, the mix of our portfolio has evolved. So you mentioned high yield. Uh, I see that you have a triple C rated bond, which would be at the higher risk end of high yield. Um, are you in any way worried about default as we head into maybe a sort of a slowing economic cycle? And um, I don't know if you want to actually touch on that bond itself uh, as to, to why that is attractive for that well, extra risk. We've we've got more than one. <laughs> now I'm not going to I'm not going to major on that too much because um, it's still only a little bit more than two percent of the overall portfolio. So in that sense, um, it's only a very small contribution to, to overall portfolio risk. But it is uh, clearly at the, the riskier end of the credit spectrum. Uh, now, nothing that we own in that space is, is on a negative credit watch. Uh, and in fact, most of them are on a positive credit watch. So you know, there's an expectation, perhaps, that you can, you can get an upgrade. Um, uh, and, and that would be positive, I think, in, in helping to drive the total return of, of some of those uh, bonds. But we look at at every credit allocation that we make, whether it is uh, in investment grade or high yield and, and, and where it is uh, in, in each of those uh, classes, as well as the equity and the alternative components that we have. And we think about how their risk contribution relates to the broader portfolio. And we're trying to deliver that overall balance. Um, and from time to time, uh, triple C's can have a role in that. Clearly, I think the risk is that default rates are likely to rise from here because we're all broadly expecting a recession of you know, how deep and how protracted that's a matter for debate um, and so we do look at the individual issues and that comes back to the point i made earlier the input of our asset class specialists is, is vital in, in helping us understand the, the individual securities which we own so look, maybe just then finally, we, we have rightly focused on bonds and fixed income. It's been the story of the quarter. This is an income product. The yeah. income opportunities from fixed income have improved dramatically. But let's just finish off by talking a little bit about your alternative assets. And we see that you have some things like plane leasing, wind farms, data center, wastewater to name but a few. Would you highlight one or two of those areas and describe the, the attractiveness of them apart from just the yield? Yeah, the, the fund's been running now for more than eight years. And, and for almost all of that period, the alternative allocations have been a meaningful part of what we've done because we've been in, we were in a bond bull market and you were getting less and less from, from uh, uh, income from bonds. And, and we liked the contractual cash flows in this alternative space, whether that be real estate, infrastructure, uh, you know, renewable energy assets, all the aircraft leasing, which you mentioned. Now, we've been out of aircraft leasing for, for quite a long period of time now. Um, we moved on from that, um, and we were right to do so pre-COVID. Um, we still retain quite a bit of infrastructure, um, but the overall allocation has shrunk quite dramatically through the course of this year. As we've increased the bonds, we have reduced the bond proxies. So infrastructure and renewable energy down from uh, a little bit over 20% at the start of the year to about 13 now. And the real estate uh, proportion of the fund down from approximately nine uh, to under five. Um, and that feels the right way as bonds are more attractive then the bond proxies lose some of their attraction. And for real estate, that's partly because uh, you know, the rising cost of debt uh, makes the funding of these businesses uh, increasingly uh, difficult. Um, where we are in that space is really in the, the more defensive areas, such as logistics and uh, data centers, which have clearly done well out of the changing environment we all live in, um, and residential. Um, but it's less than 5% of the portfolio. Renewable energy clearly benefiting from uh, the higher power prices that we see at the moment. Um, and, uh, and that's going to be a, a large part, a growing part of the mix, frankly, for energy generation um, globally uh, in any case. 
Uh, and then in the infrastructure space, some of that is the sort of regulated utilities that benefits from that shift uh, to greener energy. Uh, so names like Endesa uh, in Spain, NL in Italy, SSE in UK, companies which are driving that transition to cleaner energy. Nick, thank you very much for taking us through the elite rated Aegon Diversified Monthly Income Fund. And if you would like more information on the Aegon Diversified Monthly Income Fund, please do visit fundcalibre.com. <laughs>